I got games. Lots of games. Actually, it's not too many games. Well, what do you think? Is this a lot of games to play in one year? Do you play more than this amount, or do you play less? Let me know in the comments. I need to pick up those other games that dropped. One second. We're already well into 2023, but I thought it'd be cool to take a look at some of the games I played in 2022 and talk about them, maybe give a recommendation or two. So let's get right into it, and I'll start with this top game on the pile, Donkey Kong for Game Boy. This is a game I feel is becoming more and more popular lately. Donkey even made a video on it just before Christmas in his series of Donkey Kong videos. Now, I didn't seek this game out. It was in a collection of games that I purchased, and I decided to keep it because of the good things I've heard about it. And if you want a more in-depth analysis or review or whatever Dunkey does of this game, I would recommend checking out his video on it, because I'm not going to talk about it too much here since I have a lot of games to go through. But the thing that stood out to me about this game is just how cool Mario's movement is. When you first boot up the game, it looks like sort of a, a remake or maybe a, a sequel to the original Donkey Kong arcade game. But after the first set of levels, you'll quickly learn that it's a lot more than that. But really, what shocked me about the game is the different jumps that Mario can perform. It seems like... All of Mario's jumps that we know well from, you know, Super Mario 64, the side flip, uh, the triple jump. He even has some other jump where he stands on, you know, does a handstand and jumps off. It looks like it originated in this game. And the way you can perform them, it's just a, a 2D game and it's on the Game Boy, so your controls are limited. But they feel fluid and it just makes the game really fun. I haven't beaten the whole game, but I've gotten a decent way through it, and this is a game that I'll always take on road trips for me because of its pick-up-and-play nature. It is a, you know, an original Game Boy game after all. So this one's highly suggested. It's really not too expensive. Just buy it wherever. It's fun, and you'll love it. Okay, so let's move on to the other handheld stuff I played this year. And as you can see here, I got a pile of Vita games, and if, you, uh, if you've if you seen a couple videos from my channel, then you'll know I love the PS Vita. So let's start with the top game on this pile. The Nonary Games. So this is a compilation of 999 and Virtue's Last Reward. These are the first two games in the Zero Escape trilogy. I feel like this series isn't too well known. It is gaining traction, uh, similar to most type of anime style games. Um, but I, I'd say it's kind of like, uh, it goes like hand in hand with Danganronpa, sort of, except Danganronpa is like kind of super popular now, I'd say, whereas this maybe gets slept on a bit more. And I had already beaten both of these games prior to 2022, but I replayed 999 this year with my brother-in-law just to kind of see how he likes it. And the, the story is good. The characters are good. So I enjoy just watching him play through it. But I will say that on this playthrough, the puzzles didn't feel as difficult as when I initially played it way back when. It could just be that this was my first type of zero escape or escape room experience. After this game, I would go to real escape room experiences with my family. You know, there's like those uh, escape room stores or activity places. I, I don't really know what to call them, but they're fun. And the, the puzzles definitely uh, are, are a step up compared to 999 at the, the very least. So when going back to 999, uh, it, there's a lot of handholding with the puzzles. It's definitely fun if it's your first experience with an escape room style game. So I'd definitely give it a chance if you haven't played this series or if you haven't gone to an escape room place before. I will say that what I really liked about the first game, 999, I liked it the first time playing it and I liked it maybe even more the second time playing it with my brother-in-law, is that the scenario is really cool, like the environment. You're kind of on a, a cruise ship the Titanic, sort of, or I guess the sister. Uh, just just play the game. If you like puzzle games, this is fun. Play it. It has a kind of good story. It's kind of mysterious, blah, blah, blah. I highly recommend it. It's on PS4. It's on PC. It's on PlayStation Vita, but you probably won't get that one. But that one's a good one to have because the PS Vita is really good at visual novel style games, so it has a lot of that. Great game. Recommendation. Okay, moving on to the next PS Vita game, we have Rayman Origins. Now, this game is pretty well known. There's, you know, Rayman Origins and Rayman Legends are the two new 
Rayman games. I say new, but it's, uh, how long has it been? Like 10 years or, or so? Uh, I guess these games are fairly old now, but it's the last time we've seen Rayman. And when the games came out, they were both highly acclaimed. Uh, there's lots of people that love this game, so I, I had to pick it up for the PS Vita. The PS Vita version of the game is pretty good. It's definitely way better than the 3DS version. Don't get that version of the game. You can see comparisons online. Um, the graphics are great. I think it runs at 60 frames per second. I'm, I'm not too sure. The, the console versions do. I'm not too sure about the PS Vita game, but it felt fluid, and I didn't really have any problem with the controls. Basically, what I'm saying is if the Vita has a competent port of any game, I'm going to pick it up on the Vita because the Vita is great. Anyways, back to the actual game. Most people, I feel, are going to lean more towards Rayman Legends, which is the, the second game. But Rayman Origins is also known for being a solid game. And this game, out of all the games I've played in 2022, this game was actually the most predictable. The game's almost too consistent in the sense that like uh it's um it's fun factor is just kind of uh the same the whole time it's a, a high fun factor not not the highest fun factor ever but it's it's fun but it, it just doesn't kind of like uh ever go really high or or really low and for that reason i haven't finished the game i still want to finish the game because it is enjoyable and i'm sure later on maybe there'll be some surprises but right now it's a, a very predictable game is, is what i can say Okay, moving on to the third PS Vita game I got here, Ridge Racer on PS Vita. I think this might be the, the latest game in the series. It's either this one or the, the one that people don't like, uh, Ridge Racer Unbounded or, or whatever it's called. And the Ridge Racer series as a whole is, uh, I guess, kind of feels a bit lesser known nowadays. Uh, back in the day with, you know, the PS1, Ridge Racer was on fire. Um, but now when people think about Ridge Racer, certainly, a, a, you know, before 2022, when I thought of Ridge Racer, I thought of the... It's Ridge Racer! Ridge Racer! Remember that one? So here's this giant enemy crab. But then one day on YouTube, I saw Digital Foundry's uh, retro kind of review, a retro video of the Ridge Racer series. They do a great job with those reviews and videos. You should check them out if you get a chance. And the, the guy that was making the video, I think his, his name's John or uh, I forget. Anyways, he was so passionate about Ridge Racer and he made this the whole series look look so epic. You could not watch that video and not feel like you already know or already like Ridge Racer. So for that reason, I've started to pick up some of the games in the series and try them out. And I can kind of see where he's coming from in that video. It's it's fun. And on the surface, it may not look like anything special. It's like, oh, there's so many racing games. It's kind of like, look at this cover. Look how generic this cover is. This is this, That's a generic cover. But when you sit down and you start playing the game, well, first you see the opening and some of these games have really good openings. This one doesn't. But Ridge Racer Type 4 has probably the best, maybe I should make a video on this, the best video game opening cutscene ever. I'm talking about like before the title screen, that, you know, cinematic type of openings. Anyways, when you're, when you're starting to play this game and you're trying to get a feel for the mechanics and then you do the drift and then you feel like you're Tokyo drifting and then the music kicks in and then you get it. You get what Ridge Racer is about. It's very stylish compared to other racing games. It looks, again, looks generic from the cover, but it's super Japanese. It's kind of like the video game form of that, that one racing anime. Uh, everyone's going to kill me. What is that one racing anime from the 90s or 80s or... But you, you get what I'm saying. And it's honestly just good arcade racing fun. Um, so I'd recommend giving these games a shot when you get a chance. Oh, I forgot, I gotta talk about this game in specific. Okay, so this game, there's a thing going on with this game. Namco has fully embraced the release games unfinished and then just throw a bunch of DLC and have them pay for, you know, the rest of the game aspect for this particular Ridge Racer game. There's like no content. I think you have access to three cars and three tracks and there's not too many modes. And Ridge Racer games in general don't have a lot of content. So for this one to really not have a lot of content, like that's that's saying a lot. Uh, if you're going to get this game, uh, you know, m maybe consider doing, uh, doing the things to get the DLC on the PS Vita. Your PS Vita should be hacked anyways. Buy the game physically or whatever 
or digitally or, or something like that to just support them and then just get all the other DLC the, the way you can because really the DLC and all those other cars and those tracks, they should have been in the base game. What are you doing, Namco? What are you doing? Okay, that's my rant on this game. It's, it's fun when you, you know, uh, get all the different features of it, um, but yeah. So the fourth Vita game I played in 2022 is, uh, well, actually, this is this might be a long video. I use this the slide bar at the bottom to just skip to the games that you care about so that you can skip maybe a game like this, which you maybe don't care about. Anyways, this game is Super Beat Zonic. This is a rhythm game. I'm a pretty big fan of rhythm games. I haven't played a, a whole lot of them, but from the games that I have played, I've loved every one, and I typically spend hours and hours and hours in each of these games because they're so fun, and you can just play them when, whenever. They're super pick-up-and-play, and the music slaps for the most part. This game, uh, music is like hit or miss, at least for me personally. It's got like that mixture between the, the normie tracks and then it's got some weeb tracks, whereas maybe the, the rhythm games I'm more used to are just more on the weeb side. But I kind of like the mix here. I don't really have a, a whole lot more to say about this game. The, the mechanics are fun. It's on the PS Vita and the PS Vita is amazing at rhythm games. So if you uh, get this game, I, I think it's on PS4 as well. I'm, I'm not too sure. And then I think there's uh, a version on Switch, but uh, why would you get that on Switch if you got the, the PS Vita version? You should just... I think the Switch version is like maybe an extended cut, so that might actually be the better version to get, but uh, I just like the PlayStation Vita, so I'm gonna get the PS Vita version. And I don't have a Switch. Still, uh, I made a video on that. And yeah, anyways. And my last PS Vita game here is Super Monkey Ball Banana Splits. Now, like Ridge Racer on PS Vita, is this the last uh, original Monkey Ball game in the series? Are all the games that came after this one just remakes or remasters or whatever? Or are they also original games? I haven't really looked into it too much, but it'd be kind of cool if this was also the last original game for the series because then the Vita actually has a, a lot of last uh, original games in series that are probably not too well known. But for instance, uh, Katamari uh, has... Uh, Touch My Katamari, a uh, strange name, which is the last original Katamari game because I think from there they've only just uh, remade the original game on Switch, PS4, and whatever. But anyways, back to Monkey Ball. So I actually play Monkey Ball with my cousins and my brother-in-law quite a bit. Actually, anyone who comes over to my house, I invite them downstairs and we play Monkey Ball. Everyone loves Monkey Ball. My parents love Monkey Ball and my parents don't love games. If you want someone to play video games, just have them play Monkey Ball. So since I like those GameCube games so much, I thought I'd give the PS Vita game a try. And it's, well, um, it's not as good as those GameCube games, but I, I don't think it's bad at all. It has like this really kind of different, I'd say, art style to the, the GameCube games. And the challenges feel different. It's not just, I guess, like geometric uh, objects in your way. In this game, they have a lot of like textured dinosaurs and dragons and, you know, a whole bunch of different stuff things going on. And I haven't beat it. It still has the difficulty of the GameCube games, which I appreciate. That's probably uh, one of the best things I like about this series. So I'll be continuing to play this game into 2023. But specific to this game, well, actually, maybe not because I imagine the other handheld versions of Monkey Ball games would also have this feature, is the ability to hand the controller, or I guess in this case, the, the whole system, the, the PS Vita, over to your friend and you take turns that way. And that's kind of how the, the main game multiplayer works, which is my primary mode that I'll play with other people in the, the GameCube games. Like we'll, we'll play the mini games once in a while, but I just like taking turns in the main game mode because then you can you know laugh at your friends if they screw up or whatever, or freak out when something cool happens. So I think that mode is super awesome. It's not like a, a crazy revelation or anything. Like how, how difficult was that to program? Just a multiplayer consists of handing the PS Vita over to your friends and if they have cheeto hands then they can just get the cheeto hands on your anyways next game okay so usually i play more ps3 games throughout a year but uh this year it was kind of slim just uh just motor storm um most of the time i'll play uh, at the very least i'll play one call of duty campaign per year because i i think that that's enough and then i have to wait a year before i play the next one because just too much uh... anyways so again just like ridge racer 
this series was introduced to me. Well, not introduced to me. I've, I've, you know, I, I think everyone kind of knows this, even if they don't know too much about Mortar Storm. You've, you've seen it around. It looks like a generic kind of racing game. But if you watch the Digital Foundry video on the Mortar Storm series, I don't know what they do in those videos, but like the, the guy, John, is his name John? Am I getting this wrong? The whole video? He just makes this series and m most series he talks about seem so cool and it's like you're a fan after watching the video and you just you got to pick it up and you got to experience it so that's what i did and i have to say the first thing i noticed about this game was that unlike ridge racer where i thought the whole atmosphere and the vibe of the game was super cool super japanese like this game just has a, a very different vibe which is fine i wasn't expecting a ridge racer from this game um, but it's super, like, American is the only way you could describe it. Uh, would uh, American viewers call this game very American? Is that a good description of this game? It's got, like, that rave party vibe going on. Like, the, the whole thing is that you're at this um, festival uh, and you're kind of racing and everyone's like, Yeah, you yeah, go. Anyways, that aside, when you get into the actual racing, you can start to see what John on Digital Foundry was talking about. Because the physics of this game are, like, really really good even from today's standards from like racing games today i mean i don't play many modern games in general but the, the vehicles are just super fun to control like everything's kind of like bouncing all over the place you you hit something you hit a wall or you hit the a ground a certain way and it, it reacts in a, a, a natural type of all your vehicles feel like jello and that's great I, I like that about this game i can just imagine when it came out uh you know a while ago i guess in 2006 2007 whenever it was probably mind-blowing. I mean, it was one of the killer apps on the PlayStation. In John's uh, Digital Foundry video about it, he talks about, like, the history leading up to this game. So although I, I may not be as hooked on this series as I am on Ridge Racer, I think I'll give more time to this game. Uh, again, I, I haven't beaten this game. And maybe if I like it enough, I'll pick up the sequel. Although I, I hear the sequel is fairly different and imp improves on a lot of aspects. So maybe I'll just stop playing this game and pick up the sequel instead we'll see so yeah that's mortar storm the only ps3 game i played this year okay so let's move on to some retro stuff starting with gunstar heroes on genesis so being a couch co-op game naturally i played this with my brother-in-law and uh we actually didn't get too far so it's definitely a game that we have to go back to but the one thing that really stood out about this game is just how many things from cuphead copied or you know i guess uh took from this game and uh cuphead was made by developers that you know were fans of uh games like this and contra and other couch co-op shoot 'em up games and my brother-in-law and i beat cuphead i i think late last year it took us a while it's a fairly large game compared to super contra and gunstar heroes but it's just crazy how closely some of the scenarios in cuphead resemble some of the scenarios in gunstar heroes like, Gunstar Heroes literally had the whole uh, roll the dice thing and see kind of where you land to see what your, your next uh, event is type thing. And Gunstar Heroes also has the different weapon types, like the homing type and other types that Cuphead has as well. So let's just say that Cuphead is really faithful to this game. Um, again, this game gets a, a lot of praise. And my brother-in-law, Nick, uh, if you're watching, we, we're, we're going to have to go back and play this game. We're going to do it and we're going to beat it. So yeah, with, with that said, as of right now, I, I would give it my recommendation. It has kind of everything you'd love about an old school uh, run and gun type of style game. So um, yeah. Okay, moving on to the next Genesis game. I have Sonic the Hedgehog 1. Not 2, not 3, 1. Yeah, growing up, I, I guess I didn't play many of the old, old school Sonic games. I, I played mainly the, the 3D games and I, I really liked Sonic Unleashed and... Maybe I'll make a video on Sonic Unleashed one day because that seems to be becoming a, a very popular Sonic game. But I never did beat any of the originals. I had one of those plug-and-play Genesis mini console type things. And as a child, I just I just couldn't do it. This game was simply a, a little too hard for me. Well, it, it really didn't feel too hard. It's just I, I ran out of lives like after level two. And then that's where it ended each time for me. But as an adult, I'm a, a little more smarter. I, I know that if you, you know, collect a certain amount of rings, and you get a one-up and this and that. And so I was able to beat the game. And I have to say, um, I really like this game. I know a lot of people talk about Sonic 2 and 3 and say, you know, those are the, the cream of the crop and maybe Sonic 1 you should skip or it's just a slower pace or whatever. 
And going into Sonic 1, uh, I knew that. I knew it would be slower paced. Uh, I knew it would have more platforming or whatever, and less speed and yada, yada, yada. And I actually think that works to this game's benefit. It's a really solid 2D platforming game. And there, there still is hints of that Sonic speed that I guess we're, we're used to in Sonic 2 and 3. And I just found the challenge to be really enjoyable. So a good old platformer in Sonic 1, I recommend this. Okay, next we have a surprise, a couch co-op game, a Altered Beast for the Sega Genesis. So this game gets a lot of crap, I'll just say that right now. Um, it's a release game for the Genesis. And I guess you could say it hasn't aged well, but since so many older games haven't aged well, and since this game hasn't aged particularly well, honestly, we had fun with it. It's uh, very basic, but it's just, it's, it's just kind of crazy. Like you just turn into a bear and you're just kind of running around like bear in the big blue house. And then the noises in this game, the, the sounds it makes are, are so kind of weird and crazy. Like, welcome to your doom. <laughs> and it's kind of like edgy, the whole like Greek mythology and the, the, the way the art style look. It's, it's sort of like a, a little, a little, a little kind of mature. Like, a, I'm not describing this too well, but it, it's a fun game. I like the art style. It's really short though, that's, that's the one thing. Like, uh, I don't know if it's possible to get your money's worth out of this game. Well, I mean, it's pretty cheap, I, I think, the last time I checked. So, you know, throw it on in an hour or two and, and you're done. But still fun. Uh, I'd still, you know, obviously recommend it, so yeah. Okay, moving on to the next SNES game, we have Donkey Kong Country. Now, uh, this game, similar to 999 from the Nonary Games, I've already played before, um, but in 2022, I replayed this with my brother-in-law. We did the, the co-op mode. And I gotta say, right off the bat, the co-op mode in this game is so fun. Initially, you'd maybe be disappointed because it's not a traditional co-op mode. Like, you can't control both characters on the, the screen at the same time. Instead, it uses a take turns type of thing where you can, you know, tag your partner out and they can play for a bit. And when you die, then they go into the game. And that's actually a really fun way to play couch co-op games. It's similar to how if you play the original Super Mario Brothers game, it has a two player mode and that's, you know, taking turns. However, the problem with how two players implemented in the original Super Mario Brothers is that the one player can just make it like all the way to the end and if the other player is not as good they'll just be kind of left behind and they'll feel like they're not really doing much and the, the other player is just having the fun in donkey kong country you're both having the fun because you're both progressing at the same pace it's like both challenges it's just uh it's super fun and i gotta say ever since i got my uh my new sony or i guess they're they're not new they're they're old and i got them on facebook marketplace but my, my sony tower speakers and since I have now a different CRT and my, my setup is like perfect and I got the, the one chip Super Nintendo, boy, this game sounds and plays and, you know, looks amazing. You just gotta, this, this may be one of the games where you, where you gotta play it on a CRT. I mean, I don't want to be too, you know, too annoying about that. Just, just play games on whatever, you know, TV or whatever you have and whatnot and enjoy games. But like on a CRT, man, this game, it looks really good. I will note though that the difference between my first time playing it and more recently with my brother-in-law is the, the, the kind of a difficulty because the first time I played it, I didn't really know about the, the whole bonus levels thing. And then when I did, I just decided I, I wasn't going to go for a hundred percent. I just wanted to beat the levels and yada, yada, yada. But when playing with my brother-in-law, and I, I guess I like to torture him in, th in, th in this way, I say, no, we got to 100% this game, we got to find all the bonus rooms. And oh boy, some of the bonus rooms are just random, really random and really stupid. And it's like, how would anybody figure out where this bonus room is? But then once you start to get an understanding of the, the whole BS regarding where the bonus rooms are, you can kind of predict where they'll be in the, the, the next levels. And honestly, I'd say that difficulty spike going for all the bonus rooms has made this game more enjoyable for me. Uh, the first time I played it, it was great as well, but now it's just so much fun. But the, the problem is that now the game's much longer and my brother-in-law and I, we, we haven't beaten it. So uh, we got to beat this one. Okay, moving on to the last Super Nintendo game, I have... The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. I feel like for a lot of people, they missed out on this game somehow. Even though it's talked about as, you know, one of the best Zelda games ever, 
uh, is it just me or do a lot of people skip this game? Because uh, I've played Ocarina of Time when I was a kid, and you know I've played the other 3D games. I've even even played some of the 2D games, but not a link to the past for whatever reason. Because although I didn't have a Super Nintendo growing up, that didn't stop me from emulating games like Super Metroid. But for a link to the past, I just, I don't know, I wasn't super interested. But eventually, over the years of collecting, you're bound to come across a copy of this game sooner or later, and just looking at my one-chip Super Nintendo and my whole setup and how great it is to play Super Nintendo games now, I just... I had to put it in and see what all the hype was about. And wow, this game actually shocked me a bit because I knew it would be a similar formula to Ocarina of Time, but it seemed more similar than I had initially thought. Like at some parts, it feels straight up one-to-one -one Ocarina of Time, which is not a bad thing, not, not a bad thing at all. I mean, obviously this game did it first, but kind of my thinking about that is if you're gonna play Ocarina of Time or you're gonna play The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, me personally, I... I'd probably play Ocarina of Time. Ocarina of Time just does a better job fleshing out the world. There's like, uh, you know, Kakariko Village in this game, and it does have some characters you can talk to, and there's other characters throughout the game as well, but it's just like, it's not much. Really, A Link to the Past is about the gameplay, the, the puzzles in the dungeons, and the adventure. Oh, and the music. Oh my goodness. This music slaps. This might be the one thing where I'm like, uh, you know, the, the N64 Ocarina of Time sounds sounds good in Kakariko Village and, and whatever places. But Link to the Past, oh boy. For some reason, these 16-bit renditions just, they just sound really good. It actually has some unique soundtracks that I've only listened to in Super Smash Bros. Melee. You know, when you get to the, the, the zombie area and the, the Hyrule Temple and whatnot. Although that track may be from... Uh, Zelda 2, which I, I haven't played. But the Dark World theme, the Dark World, that's the theme I'm mainly talking about, but there's also other themes in this game which kind of feel unique to this game. Let me just play a couple of them. Here, listen. So yeah, music aside, I, I think the graphics are also really good. They're really charming. I mean, Super Nintendo graphics in general and pixel art, it just looks so good, especially on a CRT. But it kind of just also has like a cartoony style to it. Whereas the original Zelda game didn't give off that vibe, but I guess, mind you, the original Zelda game was on the original NES and you can't really do much with the graphics on that system. So it is what it is. And overall, I think this might be the perfectly sized Zelda experience. Like it's not too long, it's not too short, and everything's kind of like contained. It's uh, it's, it's easy to 100%. Why would you play this game and not 100% it? Just find all the hearts. It's fun to find the hearts. It's an adventure. And in my playthrough specifically, something really cool happened where You'll, you'll know if you've played the game, but at the final confrontation with Ganon, you gotta drop through the hole and, and then you can, you know, start battling Ganon. But for me, the first time I dropped through the hole, the game loaded that secret area. Um, now, I, I've read online that loading that secret area is, is kind of rare and doesn't happen to a lot of people. So it's crazy that when I was expecting to battle Ganon, I got loaded into this random room full of rupees and I'm like, what, what, what is going on? What, what's happening? And then I just walk out and then I, you know, walk back up the mountain and uh, the, the hole and I go back into it and there's Ganon like, what was that? So I thought that kind of enhanced my experience of the game, especially when I read into it. I'm like, oh, this is, this is kind of cool. Lastly, I will note that this game is also kind of 
quirky at at some points like uh when you first go into the dark world you're a, a bunny rabbit right and the the music is like really weird and it kind of gives off earthbound vibes and that's from someone who hasn't played earthbound so i could just be talking out of nowhere but but that that's kind of the, the vibe i'm getting and that's all i got to say on a link to the past at least for this video anyways Okay, so let's move on to the only NES game I've played this year, and that would be Batman the Video Game. Now, this game, much like a lot of the other games I have on this list, is highly acclaimed. This is like an NES game that you have to play. And I played it and I didn't get far. But that's just because this, this game is, is really difficult. It's known for being difficult. I knew that going into playing the game. And it was a great time. Sometimes you just need the game to like uh, kick your butt. That's what the NES is really good at doing. But I never thought the game was unfair, just challenging. Now, unlike Zelda 1 on the NES, which I was talking about a, a bit ago, this game really makes great use of the NES's graphics. I'm not really a Batman fan or anything, but this game's got like kind of cutscenes and then everything is really well like animated and Batman's got a lot of moves and gadgets and yada yada yada. It's, it's a great looking game. But for me, again, just like A Link to the Past, it's all about the music with this game. This game's soundtrack has no reason to be as good as it is. Imagine all the later levels have crappy music. Like, I don't even know if they're, they're Batman songs. I don't, I don't know if there they're are Batman songs, but whatever the case is, this game sounds great, it looks great, and the gameplay is fun and challenging, and I'll have to get back to it soon. Okay, let's move on to the Wii U. Starting with... Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed. Has this game been re-released? I, I don't think so. I know there's Team Sonic Racing, but is this the preferred Sonic Racing game? Like, uh, actually, I think the, the first Sonic game, uh, uh, Sonic, sorry, Sonic Racing game, Sonic and All-Stars Racing, you know, without the Transform, I hear that's a really good game. I don't have experience with it. That's on my hit list. But same as some of the other games on my list here, this is a great couch co-op game. <laughs> or in this case, I played with my two other cousins, so there were three of us, and if you're playing with three people, you gotta get the Wii U version. Because with three people, you can have one person playing on the gamepad, and the other two people can play on the TV. Which is much better than having three players play on the TV like Mario Kart 8 does on Wii U. And it's great how you can pretty much play the full game with other players. Like, the campaign almost seems tuned to having other players with you so that you can beat the challenges. And there's a lot of variety in those challenges. Our personal favorite is when you're racing against the clock and there's kind of like traffic in your way that you have to avoid. And then there's, the, you know, there's the green cars that are like fairly easy to avoid, but then there's the yellow cars that like move in a, a weird way. And then there's the, the blue cars or the, the cops that sort of go right towards you. And I love how when one person gets a time bonus, that time bonus transfers over to the other player, so it really feels like you're working together. And it goes without saying that the car transformations are really fun and the way the levels kind of transform throughout the race. And obviously the game has some great references to Sega characters and franchises like Monkey Ball and uh, Wreck-It Ralph. So yeah, it's a blast. Uh, this is definitely one game I, I wouldn't play alone. You gotta get some friends over and play this game. It's so fun. Okay, the next Wii U game is, uh, the, the Wii U is just really good at couch co-op. I'd say the Super Nintendo perfects the two-player action, whereas the Wii U might be up there with the N64 when it comes to three and four-player games. So Super Mario 3D World on the Wii U. Uh, the one thing that I guess kind of bugs me, like going into this game when, whenever we pop it in, is that uh, the Switch version, I, I guess, is the definitive version. Uh, I don't care so much about Bowser's Fury. That's more like an add-on DLC. It's mainly the gameplay change that the Switch version makes. The, the characters are faster in the Switch version, which, you know, uh, being a Super Smash Bros. Melee player, I, I tend to like in games like these. But I guess, like, the slower nature of this version of the game makes you want to do everything you can to be faster, which then rewards kind of like, not really the advanced techniques, but you know, you do like the one somersault and then you do the long jump. And so those kind of small moments of that speed feel all the better because the game is going slow. I'm just trying to rationalize why I have the Wii U version at this point. 
So yeah, it's it's great. It's Mario Brothers. It's it's you know multiplayer. I'd say with four players though, because I, I once I, I did play with my cousins and also my brother-in-law. So we, we played the four player, and four player gets kind of hectic, kind of hectic. But three player, three player seems manageable. It's like okay, th this is this this can work. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe keep that in mind if you're planning to play with friends, or just maybe all four of you are really good and it doesn't matter anyways. Okay, we're gonna skip the last Wii U game for now and move on to the only Switch game that I own. I may no longer have a Switch console, uh, watch my Switch video if you haven't seen it already, but I kept Legends Arceus because this game, man, like this game, this game really makes a guy love Pokemon again. Maybe for some people it let them down, but for me it hit most items on my checklist. You can watch my video I made a while back on Legends Arceus before it came out, and I think only the major point from that video that this game maybe didn't fully reach was in the story department. Now, I don't think it was terrible, it just wasn't quite what I envisioned, and in my second video I made about Legends Arceus, where I said I wasn't really feeling the story and I hope it gets a lot better, it, uh, at least for me, it didn't really get a lot better. And that's mainly because the character interactions are still uh, Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. But I really like what they did with the later part of the game in terms of like, you know, they, they all go to Spear Pillar and then there's, you know, Dialga and Palkia and, and all that kind of, all the legendary stuff was great until like the, uh, the post game when you, you get into the, the other legendaries and it's a little awkward. I did like, you know, chasing down the, the genies uh, I, I thought that was a really cool aspect, but uh, anyways, the, the highlight is Arceus, and that final battle with Arceus, once you collect all the Pokemon in the game, which really isn't hard to do, I did it pretty easily because the appeal of this game is catching Pokemon, so naturally I was catching Pokemon throughout the game, so after when I, you know, got to Arceus and it wouldn't let me continue to, to battle Arceus, it said I had like oh, you have to obtain, you know, maybe like six more Pokemon, according to my Pokedex. Really not many. So I went, I, you know, caught the Pokemon I needed to catch, and in no time at all, I went back up to Arceus, and that is the sickest battle ever. It kind of is like Dark Souls meets Pokemon. And oh my goodness, I, I, I won't spoil this aspect of the final battle, but maybe I'll just hint at it. Like, there's... You know, in, in the first game, Arceus is a, a nor or first game, you mean a, a Pokemon Diamond and Pearl and Platinum. Arceus is a normal type when you battle it, right? But in this game, the developers utilize Arceus's ability to, you know, be multiple types in the most creative way possible. And some of my Pokemon just plain up got destroyed. I probably just spoiled everything by saying that. But yeah, it's just really cool. You know what I'm talking about if you've played it and it's great. And this game just never really got boring for me. Like, even in the, the middle point where it was just kind of repetition, the repetition was never boring because it, it, it's always exciting to discover new Pokemon. I mean, you know, I, I know all the Pokemon already, but it, it's like, oh my god, what Pokemon is that? And then all of a sudden you're like halfway across the map and it's like, I, I've been distracted. You're just chasing like Pokemon all around the map and, and that's how you're doing your exploring. I haven't played the latest Pokemon game in the series, uh, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, so I don't know how those games compare to the open world in this game. I know that those games have a, a much more, like, an actual open world where this is, like, uh, open sections. But, like, man, I, I, I just can't play a Pokemon game now without these catching mechanics. I, I just can't. I'm sorry, I know a lot of people hate them, and they're like, no, you, you, gotta, you gotta always battle a Pokemon to catch them. It's too easy. But it's just, it's, sometimes you just don't want to battle. A, a, a lot, let me correct myself. A lot of times you don't want to battle a Pokemon to catch them. It just takes too long. It's a drag. It prevents me from catching as many Pokemon as I would like to do in the main series because it's just, uh, it's just so slow. Whereas in Legends Arceus, I'm catching every Pokemon, and I'm constantly switching out my team members, and it's just... So much Pokemon in this game. It's the Pokemon game with the most Pokemon. Well, probably not like, you know, there's, there's no like national decks or... You, you kind of know what I'm saying, hopefully. If you want a better explanation of what I'm trying to say, watch my, I think, my second Arceus video. I'll, I'll link it. Um, I, I really go in depth on why this game is so special. Also, the music slaps.
that 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 goes without saying. When when a soundtrack is good, I will uh I will make note of it. I guess Mario and Sonic they they have a good soundtrack. This this music slaps. It really captures the essence of Generation Four. I haven't played the you know the the chibi remake of of Gen Four, Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl. I I don't really have an intention to play those games, but. I also haven't listened to the music in those games, so maybe I'm not giving it a fair chance. But this music, it's just like, it really, it hits that spot. And it's like, this is the Gen 4 remake. Like, listen to the Eterna Forest, you know, re reimagining in this game. It is amazing. Okay, moving on to the final game in my pile here. And the last game that I, or the, the most recent game that I've played... The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild on a Wii U. I don't have a Switch. Do you know I don't have a Switch by now? I don't have a Switch. Other than Legends Arceus, this has to be one of the more recent games that I've played. I don't play many modern games. So I'm not quite used to kind of the, uh, the new mechanics that more modern games will have like how smart the the ai can be compared to older games and obviously the the graphics like this is a step up over legends arceus and legends arceus is a dozen steps up over pokemon scarlet and violet and the game chugs i'll, I'll admit it it does chug at, at certain parts uh maybe the, the switch version is better i i don't know i see some people say that the, the wii u version is better in that regard so who knows but it never took me out of the experience i know this version plays at a lower resolution than the switch version i don't know why i always get into technical details of the game i'm supposed to be talking about the game and i'm talking about all this technical whatever i, I kind of like to talk about this stuff sometimes anyways onto the gameplay the soundtrack sucks i don't know, maybe if you maybe you have a different opinion okay you know put it in the comments and we can talk it out and this and that but like when the soundtrack in a game is good I'll bring it up and I'll say the soundtrack is really good. When the soundtrack in the game disappoints, I got to bring that up as well. And like, I, I knew that going in. I knew this game and you know, these these old uh, modern games, they they go for the more uh, simplistic approach to their, their sounds, they, the environmental sounds, this, that, and they, but they, they sacrifice the bangers. Arceus had the bangers in an open world. And then if you, in Arceus, if you crouch, it, everything gets quiet and then you can listen to your environment. But this game doesn't have that. This game is just like one song on repeat and you only hear like parts of the actual song and otherwise it's just all environmental sounds. And mind you, like this, this, it, it helps, it's good. I, I can see why they did it. Like the environmental sounds, it, it's interesting. It's like, especially, you know, put on headphones, play this game and then you can hear an animal over there an enemy over there, everything sounds great. But I, I'm so used to Zelda games having really catchy tunes. And again, I haven't beaten this game. I've, I've played quite a bit, maybe like 50 hours, but I honestly haven't gotten too far into it. Um, so maybe the soundtrack gets better. And I know that when you get to Hyrule Castle, it plays a, a more melodic type of theme and it does sound good. Oh, speaking of which, yeah, getting to you know Hyrule Castle, I have to say the highlight for me when playing this game was right after leaving the Great Plateau. The whole reason I wanted to play this game was because leading up to the game's release, uh, the developers always talked about how you can just go straight to the final boss after the Great Plateau and you can just beat the game if you're, I guess, skilled enough or if you, whatever. Um, so I wanted to test that out. So I immediately glided down to the grass, found a horse, and then booked it to Hyrule Castle with, with pretty much nothing. Like I had three hearts, four hearts, and like just crap items all around. And then eventually partway to Hyrule Castle, I lost my horse. And so I was running on foot away from the guardians. And then I, I learned to get really good at barely dodging the guardians beam attack, where if, if you're kind of running in a straight line, you have the camera faced around so you can see the guardian. And just when they're about to shoot you, you kind of jump out of the way. And then you just kind of rinse and repeat. And, and you know, if you do that enough times, the guardian will, will give up or you'll, you'll eventually get to Hyrule Castle. And then when I got into Hyrule Castle, it felt like I was playing Metal Gear Solid. I had to be sneaky. I had to be resourceful. But somehow I made it to the very top of the castle. And thank you, game developers. You rewarded me for climbing up right to the peak tippy top. And there's uh, the, you know, the Koron, whatever, the seed, the, those, those little guys. Koroks, Koroks. And so with what little I had, I saved my game and went into the final battle with Ganon. 
and it really didn't go how I expected at all. I thought I'd just get one shot and then realize that I just, I just can't do this unless I'm extremely skilled. But I, I just kept staying alive for hours. Yeah, it turns out it's not the difficulty of the actual boss fight, at least for the, I, I think I fought against uh, three stages of the boss and gave up after the third stage. It's just that your weapons do no damage, so it literally takes forever. I ran out of weapons, and then I started resorting to using my bombs, and the bombs do, like, no damage at all. And from there, I was like, I, I don't know if this is fun anymore. Maybe I should just, uh, quit and, you know, get stronger. So in that respect, I guess it was kind of a bummer. Like, I, I maybe would have preferred just to get touched once and wiped out. Whereas even with three hearts, I would get hit sometimes, but I wouldn't get wiped out. I'd, like, hang on with half a heart or whatever, and then I'd have food and recover. And it kind of felt like I was playing an RPG. Like, in an RPG, you can't skillfully, in, in, in you know, most RPGs, you can't skillfully overcome a challenge as much as you can overcome it just by uh, leveling up your character. And in some cases, you have to level up your characters. Like, you can't just outplay the opponent. Whereas a lot of action-focused games, especially older games like, uh, I don't know, like Ninja Gaiden on the NES or other types of games like that, really value your skill and just your skill. If you have the skill, you can just beat the game and make it look like a breeze. So anyways, I headed back to the bottom of the Great Plateau and I started to play the game the normal way, I guess. And I gotta say, I personally found Legends Arceus to have a more fun, open world. Maybe I'm playing Breath of the Wild wrong or maybe I just need to give it more time. But for me, in Breath of the Wild, the most exciting aspect about going on the kind of adventure is to set a goal in mind, set a destination, and then sort of get lost on your way there. And so for the first bit after you leave the Great Plateau, you can do that. You have certain objectives, but then the game like really, really opens up and, you know, the, the story basically says to, to go anywhere, go to any of these locations that have uh, the, the Zelda memories. And from there, it's like, okay, well, what goal do I set? Like, what, a, what objective do I set? I look on the map and I'm like, okay, maybe I can go there, but like, is there gonna be a, a reward for going there? And, and a lot of times there, there is a reward. The reward is the Korok seeds for a, a lot of the area in the, the open world. And then sometimes it's a really powerful item and then sometimes it's a new shrine. But none of those felt like the kind of a, the reward I was looking for. It didn't really feel rewarding enough. Whereas in Pokemon Legends Arceus, as soon as you enter a new area, you immediately see a ton of presents in front of you in the form of different Pokemon. Maybe I just love Pokemon. To be fair though, Breath of the Wild sort of has that aspect going on as well, although to a much lesser extent. I kind of joked with my friends, I said, this is the best hunting game in recent years. Of course, I haven't played any other, you know, actual hunting games, but this game feels like a competent hunting game. It's fun chasing a wild boar and, you know, tracking, tracking them down and shooting them with the arrow. And to be fair to the sound design of this game, the environmental sounds work really well in that scenario. I think Legends Arceus may have had a bit of that as well, but a lot of times it felt like Legends Arceus was cheating or just faking Pokemon cries in the distance. Whereas Breath of the Wild really only played sounds of actual things that you could go to or you could see. So kudos to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Best hunting game. No, I actually really like the gameplay as well. All Link's movement options have been drastically improved since Skyward Sword. Especially if you look at horseback riding, now that has drastically improved since Twilight Princess. In Twilight Princess, uh, you could just mount your horse one way, and then you can, you know, swing your sword, and you can shoot arrows while riding on it. But in Breath of the Wild, it's fun to simply get onto your horse. There, there's so many ways to board or to, to mount your horse. When you whistle for your horse and you see it running towards you and then you run at it and then you jump on it and then it does like that cool animation where you swing around it. Or if you see it way down there and then you kind of jump, glide for a bit and land perfectly on it. The horse just feels more believable and, and fun in this game. Uh, part of that is also that the, the horse can be stuck. Like it, it can get stuck and it can fall and it can die and it doesn't just despawn. 
nor can it simply respawn, at least if you're not at a horse stable. Which I think is actually a really big benefit, because in Legends Arceus, when I got the horse, I no longer walked around or ran. Like, there, there wasn't much need to do any running. And at the beginning of the game, before getting the horse, kind of going out on your own and running felt like a, a real Pokemon adventure. It's just you, your backpack, and you, you can't just, like, fly around everywhere. You really had to explore cautiously this open world. So in Breath of the Wild, by limiting the way you can call your horse and how, you know, your horse can get stuck, it allows both moments where you're, you know, riding your horse really fast, getting to your destination, but also the moments where you're forced to run on foot again and it makes it feel more like a, a, a big grand adventure. That's happened to me a lot where I, I'm, I'm trying to get to a destination and my, my horse dies or whatever or I lose it somehow and then I'm forced to walk. But in doing so, I'm, I'm actually glad because it allows me to, you know, take a deep breath, take in my surroundings and find stuff that I normally wouldn't have found just by glazing past it with my horse. I will say though that I don't know how to feel about the whole weapon breaking system. The inventory also feels like kind of a, a slog to navigate, at least compared to Legends Arceus. And Legends Arceus, especially for cooking or crafting items, you just kind of click on the item you want to craft and it pulls the ingredients together and just makes it. But in Breath of the Wild, there doesn't seem to be any sort of cookbook, at least not any that's readily available to you. Um, maybe I haven't played far enough. Maybe I'm just dumb. So unless you remember how to make certain things, you're just kind of randomly putting ingredients together and saying like, I, I hope it makes this or, uh, yeah, it just kind of feels a little aimless. But regarding the weapon breaking system, I'm, on one hand, it allows me to try out many different weapons, which is cool. But on the other hand, all the rewards feel like, again, they're, they're not really, uh, are they really rewards? They're like rewards for a bit. It's like, use it, but then it breaks. So it's like, don't use it, but then you don't get the enjoyment of using it. So right now in Breath of the Wild, I'm trying to get as many hearts as possible so I can pull out that master sword. And then hopefully I won't have to worry about that as much. And then from that point, I think I might actually book it back over the Hyrule Castle and see if I can beat the game. I want to see what the minimum requirement is to beat the game, at least without the final boss being a slog. And I'm not a speedrunner, so I guess the, uh, the casual way of beating the game. So yeah, that's my opinion on Breath of the Wild. I don't think I've really given a fair chance in this video, considering I haven't played the full game, and I'm sure there's a lot to look forward to. But I think that's about good for now. Okay, so that's pretty much everything. I might go more in-depth on some of these games in an actual more formal video, but I thought it'd be cool to maybe do this type of video once a year just to kind of let all my thoughts out and opinions on, you know, the games I played. Wait! I actually forgot, I, I, I literally almost forgot this last game. That's because it's not like, a, I don't have a, a physical copy of this game, um, and that's because this game is digital only, at, at least in... Uh, North America, it's digital only. In Japan, they have a physical version. And that's Trails in the Sky, second chapter. Now, oh boy, just when I thought this video was done, I, I forgot about the, the biggest game. This was the biggest game I've played this year. The, the most important game I've played this year. The Trail series, you gotta play the Trail series. I'm going to make a video on the Trail series at some point because it is a great series. I've, I've only played Trails in the Sky, first chapter and second chapter so far. But this series is just kind of everything you'd, you'd want in an RPG, especially if you like good character interactions. This series, and you know specifically uh, first chapter and second chapter, are really good at those character the character moments when you know they're just having sort of small talk or the uh, the characters they they feel alive they feel like uh, they feel believable the the world feels believable mother's basement a, a youtube channel um, they made an in-depth video on this series and i do recommend you check it out cuz it'll do a better explanation of what you know i'm doing right now 
But for me, that game, uh, especially if you combine it with the first game, Trails in the Sky first chapter, Trails in the Sky second chapter, it's really a duology. It's got to be up there with Persona in terms of the, the character interactions. I think it's more believable in some aspects. Trails in the Sky definitely uses more of the side characters, and I think in a, a better way, whereas Persona's mainly focused on the main characters, and then the, uh, I guess there are some side characters, but I, you know, you might be able to group them in with the main cast. In the Trails series, you have some random NPC that remembers you from the first game and is all like, Oh, hey, protagonist, remember when you rescued me in that one side mission in the first game? And then all of a sudden you see they have like a backstory and this and that, and they're an actual like fully fleshed out character. But yeah, it's a really great series, at least from what I can tell so far. I'm really excited to play the third game when, whenever I get around to it. And it'll be super interesting to see how these characters evolve in like the 12th game because these these that it's just it's one continuous story and some plot points aren't fully realized until you play the later games in the series so yeah that's all i'll say about that game for now just because i want to go more in depth about it i highly highly recommend it if you like rpgs uh you know i guess particularly jrpgs and the music slaps obviously the music slaps i think most games that i really really like that the music just is is really good Mind you, I played the uh, Evolution version of the game on the PS Vita, uh, so the soundtracks are a bit different. Um, I think for the most part they are just as good or in some aspects better than the originals, but a lot of people would disagree. So uh, take that for what it is, um, the PS Vita version. If you have a PS Vita, then you can hack it and then you can, you know, do whatever and get all the, I got the, you know, English translation patch. The character art is also different. It has a little more modern anime feel to the portraits, uh, which may not be to everyone's liking. The uh, original has a very kind of traditional uh, anime aesthetic, which which is really cool. But I sort of like the approach they took with the Evolution remakes because that way it's not so shocking when you go to the later games in the series because the later games in the series all have that generic anime art style. So yeah, that about wraps this video up. I, I hope I'm not missing any games. Let me know in the comments if any of the games I've discussed uh, maybe piqued your interest or maybe if you share any of the same opinions that I've had. And also let me know if any of these games you want me to maybe go more in depth on in a, an actual video. If you've watched this far, you're uh, kind of insane, but thanks nonetheless and I'll see you guys next time.